topic of forest ecology. It is a very uh, complex topic, and there are a lot. There's lots of information here, so um, don't get too overwhelmed by it. And feel free to um, ask questions as they come up, and I'll and I will address them. Um, ecology is. Um, I will. I'm not going to read through most of these slides, but um, this is just the study of the relation the relationship between organisms and their environment. Um, the, I wanted to start out this uh, discussion kind of bringing us into the context of where we are and where we live. Uh, this particular uh, photograph map shows the northern forest ecoregion, and it runs from uh, west of the Adirondacks at the Tug Hill Plateau all the way out to the tip of Cape Breton, and includes the states. Oops, I just moved my uh, slide. Went quickly, but it's uh, the same map, but I'm going to talk about this a little bit more here. So this, the northern forest is um, located in New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. And if you don't remember anything else about this presentation, I would like you to try to remember this, that this ecoregion is the most intact, broad-leaved, temperate forest in the entire world. So that means that this forest where we live is of global significance. Uh, and the, the meaning of it being intact, it's intact, functionally intact. So it's connected, and we have all, most of the species uh, that existed prior to colonization uh, by Europeans. So we have lost a few species, but in, in most cases, everything is still here, and the ecosystem is functioning well. We also are located in an area where there are lots of people next to the forest. So this particular ecoregion is actually under a great deal of pressure now, and so we have an opportunity and a responsibility to protect it. Uh, Two Countries, One Forest is a uh, science consortium, and that an international science consortium that took a look at this area and identified five different linkages that are really important to maintain over time between the Tug Hill and the Adirondacks, the Adirondacks to the Southern Greens, the, nor the Northern Greens to the Suttons, and up into the Three Borders region and across from New Brunswick to Nova Scotia. If each, each of those linkages need to be maintained to keep this whole forest intact. So uh, this is a, just an important message on what um, the ecology is of where we're located in our own region. So it was a global significance looking at our backyard. But now we're just really going to talk a little bit more specifically about Vermont. But this does pertain to that entire ecoregion forest because the forest is the same in terms of species composition across the forest. But looking in Vermont, uh, we have, as you can see from this slide, that the majority of our forest is really found in this maple beech birch forest. It's the northern hardwood type. We do have representation of, of white and red pine, spruce fir, the oak pine, but oak pine tends to be a little bit further south and east, uh, as well as the oak hickory. Um, so these are different forest types that are found in Vermont. And just to make a note and a point about uh, climate change is that uh, some of these forest types that might be found further south, like the oak pine and the oak hickory, are located uh, currently in Vermont primarily in the Champlain Valley area. Uh, but as we move towards the future, some of these species are going to become more prevalent uh, throughout our landscape. So these are things to think about as we think of ecosystems and ecosystem function, that our forests aren't necessarily going to stay exactly the same as we go um, into the future due to climate change. Uh, we do classify our, our ecosystems by natural communities. And in Vermont, we probably have around 90 or so natural communities, um, some of those being wetland communities, others are upland forest. Um, but the ones that we're, we're going to be considering today when we think about forest ecology are, is the upland forest and the, and the wetland forest. So I mentioned before that northern hardwood is our primary matrix forest. We have six different types of northern hardwood. And if you look at the oak pine northern hardwoods, we have 12 different types of those uh, and seven spruce fir northern hardwoods. But you can see in the upland forest, the northern hardwood is a component of of almost all of these types. And then if you get down to the wetland forest, which we'll talk about briefly, um, they have great 
importance on our landscape for a multitude of reasons. And so we look at floodplain forests, hardwood swamps, softwood swamps, and then those smaller forested wetlands like seeps and vernal pools. Looking at the floodplain forests, uh, these are critically important for um, flood control, for um, metabolizing the nutrients that move through the landscape from a farm field. If the farm soils are, are deposited in this forested floodplain, those nutrients are metabolized and soaked in and they don't make it down to Lake Champlain, which, at, which we're, we're concerned about in terms of phosphorus load. So having a functioning, healthy floodplain forest along our river systems and along the lake shore is very important for water quality reasons. It's also incredibly important for wildlife habitat movement or wildlife movement in, in its habitat. So with a, with a whole and complete floodplain forest, animals have a way to move across the landscape, even through farming communities, as long as there is an intact buffer. So these uh, areas are really important. Uh, we can also find some rare plants in areas here can, can, in where animals like the cerulean warbler, uh, plants like green dragon and goldie's wood fern, those are, those are plants that are found in these floodplain forests. Hardwood swamps are also a place where um, we can think of most of these as sponges. You know, when we're thinking about climate change being a concern, we really want to have ways on, in our landscape to hold the water through drought uh, seasons. The summers are predicted to be more droughty. So if we can keep these forested wetlands intact and functioning, then they are places where uh, we can retain and hold water. Uh, it's also a place where we can find all sorts of rare and uncommon plants and animals. Uh, showy lady slippers is a good is a good one. Four-toed salamanders, tiny little salamander that's really hard to find. They're found in some of these hardwood swamps. Softwood swamps are the same same deal in terms of uh, working as a sponge, but they're very different in the types of soils that you find them on. Uh, one of our uh, most common softwood swamps is a cedar swamp. Uh, they're typically found on very rich sites. Uh, so when you think about where species are growing, it's very dependent on the soil composition, the nutrients, and the water. And we're, we're going to get into that in more detail. Uh, but the black spruce and spruce tamarack swamps, hemlock swamps, they're, they're very different on the landscape, and they uh, occur in different situations. These, again, are excellent wildlife habitat areas. Uh, certainly, cedar swamps would be a wonderful place to find snowshoe hare, and therefore, Canada lynx can hold snow deep into the winter and uh, find many rare plants. Seeps, seeps are the source of our, of our streams and rivers. These are the, the areas that are concave on, this, on the landscape where the surrounding groundwater can filter in and then bubble back out again. So it's held, this is water that's held and then resurfaces. Um, and that is the place where they can um, congeal and many different seeps can then form an upland stream. That upland stream will um, connect into a, a, a larger stream and then into our rivers and providing water quality. So this is the source of our water quality. And then, of course, we have uh, vernal pools, which are considered a forested wetland as well. And these are uh, small concave areas that hold snow melt or, and heavy rains from the spring. They are temporary. That's why they're called vernal. They are only there in the spring or sometimes in the fall if we have a lot of rain. But they're really dependent on snow melt. And so we're very concerned about these vernal pools. Uh, some of them are we're probably going to be losing some of them. So it's important to protect them across the landscape so populations that exist in them, which are often obligate populations like wood frog and spotted salamander, have a, a place where they can move to if one fails. So we have a metapopulation of species across the landscape and then individual populations that go back to the vernal pool. Once a a salamander breeds in a pool, it goes back every year. That spotted salamander on the right of the screen, that's a spotted salamander that can live to be 20 or, or 25 years old, and they'll be returning to that very same vernal pool every year. 
it's the offspring is the chance where they are might be a wanderer or two. In every population of species, there's always uh, some some explorer, and so that uh, that one animal may be able to find uh, another population. We're therefore mixing up the genetic pool and actually surviving. So keeping all of these uh, fernal pools across the landscape is is critically important to these populations of amphibians and um, the other other creatures that uh, survive here. Um, I'm going to talk now about really what, what it means when we're talking about ecology and we're, and we're going to talk about what site is. So with the site is where um, the many different components of the ecosystem come together to determine what forest community is going to be found there. Uh, we are also going to speak a little bit about the types of forests that we look at. We have even-aged forests, and those even-aged forests are trees that all start about the same time. And in these two photographs, they're represented in Vermont by plantations, so tr people that have planted trees. We did a lot of that in the 50s to stabilize soil, and just the idea of abandoning farmland um, was an anathema at the time, and we didn't, we didn't want the natural processes to take place, so we sped it up by planting trees. Uh, the photograph below shows uh, an abandoned farm field that has gone through a natural process, and so this is an early young forest of northern hardwood. Um, they don't typically, though, grow at the same rate. So some trees may be bigger than other trees, but they're the same age. So they remembered that the, uh, when you look at a forest, you can often see big trees and little trees, but in some situations, that's going to be trees of the same age, and they are just growing at different rates because of the, of the nutrients and the sunlight. Uh, so an even-aged forest may very well have uh, very different uh, varying diameters particularly in a mixed species stand. If you have a pine tree growing next to a red maple, then that pine tree is just going to be a bigger tree because it grows at a faster rate than the hardwood does. Um, and it's a little different than a two-age stand, but we also consider two-age stands as being even aged because through management, one of those age classes will be removed at some point. Uh, so a two-age stand is considered even aged. Now we look at an uneven age stand. These are trees that are regenerated periodically over time. So you have different trees that are both uh, young and very old, but also in that middle range. So having at least three age classes is critically important to make to um, identifying this as an uneven age stand. And you can see in that photograph the the diversity that is that exists in this uneven age stand. I'm going to be talking about about climate change as I go through this whole talk because I think it's an over or an underlying component to what we're thinking about these days. Now, just as an idea, if uh, if we were to look at this forest and a windstorm came through, and we do know that natural disturbances are increasing, if a, if this blew over, we have young trees in the understory ready to take off. So we have a forest that can take the place of the forest that has been um, disturbed. So again, we're having an upper layer, a middle layer, and a lower layer. This is actually also an awesome bird habitat because most of our songbirds, our interior forest songbirds, need this lower canopy to nest in. Our, our interior forest songbirds are nesting in areas that are from the ground to about 30 feet up in the air. They do not nest in the upper canopy. Um, of course, in an a every age class, there are trees that are growing better than others, and so they, again, have different growth rates. Some trees will be suppressed and not grow at a, at a rate, but they can be released. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about structure. We talked about the canopy, uh, the upper canopy, the mid canopy, and the understory. Those are all layers in the forest, or we think of vertical structure, so the up and down layers in the forest. Um, we also can consider that forest floor, the herb, herbaceous layer, that can lose the ferns and all the, the uh, ephemeral plants and the, and the flowers in the forest um, to a shrub and a shrub layer that might uh, in, indicate some viburnums or blueberries. Those are considered the shrubs in our forest, not the understory. The understory is made up of regeneration that become trees. So we have that understory, midstory, overstory. 
Now to look at horizontal structure, the, the, the previous was vertical structure. It said up and down from the bottom of the forest floor up to the tippy top of the canopy. Now the horizontal structure is how diversified it is across the landscape. So are there areas that are open, which are gaps in the forest, and that's often caused by natural disturbance. A little wind throw would knock over a few trees and there's a gap. Um, then there's skips where there might be a, a density, an area that's very, very dense. And a, another vertical or horizontal diversity would be the species composition. If we have a varying species composition, it's going to have different habitat niches. Um, and so then those, those density issues. We also want to think about standing dead and dying trees, which are critically important to our ecosystem function and health. Uh, standing dead and dying trees are offering places for invertebrates to, to live, which is the bottom of the food chain. Uh, a dead standing pine is an awesome place for a uh, bat to, uh, in the summertime, to be roosting with its one pup. And so there are places that are really important to have these snags and dying trees. And then trees on the ground, you can see the picture on the right, that is a tip up. There's a tree that is tipped over and another tree tipped over on top of that one. So that's going to take a long time for that tree to degrade and become soil. So the longer it exists as a, a downwoody material, it's, it's sequestering carbon, it's providing habitat, it's providing nitrogen fixation, a place for animals to uh, display and roost and forage. It has a great deal of function in the landscape. One of the things I find when I go out in the woods with landowners is I, I, they, I, we look at this down woody material and, and they say, oh my goodness, I have to come in and pick this up and, and turn it into firewood. And there are times when that works and time when it's, it's better just to leave it there because of the function it, it uh, provides for the landscape. This is a called coarse woody material or um, coarse woody debris. I like to use the word material because debris makes it sound like it's garbage and it certainly is not. We also have fine woody material which is would be indicative of a, of a tree that blows over or falls over and it's the crown. So everything that the branches uh, are in leaves kind of forms a small pile which is an, a wonderful place for birds to forage and uh, a great place also to kind of keep the deer from browsing the new a newly established regeneration that might come in once a gap is created. So those are functions of, of structure in the forest. And just to take a quick look at what those look like, this is a gap above that has sunlight hitting the forest floor and a blast of regeneration. And that is caused because there is a canopy hole. Um, we also are looking at this multiple age class and then the coarse woody material and snags. So these are uh, some images of what I just uh, spoke about. We also are going to talk about how trees grow and what they need. And uh, this is just, a, to me, a, a, it's a beautiful slide because if you see what's being held in the hand, that is a seed of a sequoia. And then we see the, the new regeneration of that, of that little tree. Um, that's the baby tree. And my, the commissioner of forest and parks at a, at a younger time in his life is standing next to one of these trees as it has grown to maturity. So it's gone from that tiny little seed to the, the largest organism on Earth. Uh, pretty darn amazing. Um, so factors affecting tree growth are, are its environment, the physical and the biological elements. When we break it down into physical factors, we're really talking about climate and soil. Biological factors include the plants that are growing with it, the associated plants, the animals, the fungi, and the microbes. So these are all the things that may affect and impact um, the ecosystem where trees and forests are growing. I'm going to break that down a little. Um, so silvix is really what we're talking about. When we're talking about the study of trees, we're talking about what a particular tree needs in order to grow. And we can predict a great deal by knowing and studying the silvix of these trees. Um, it, so we, it helps us to determine the life history, the characteristics of the trees and stands in relation to its environment, and the requirements they may need, that particular species may need. Uh, it includes all of these interactions of soil, light, moisture, nutrients, flowering and seed production, to topographic position, the reaction to competition, growth rates, and susceptibility to disease and insects. When we know these things about individual species, we can predict how they're going to grow on the, in the environment, and we can therefore predict how we could manage those 
through silviculture. So silvix is the study of the tree, silviculture is the management or what we term as forestry. Um, some species, you know, when we think about what it means and how we're going to manage this, uh, species can have deep root systems and they and cannot tolerate shallow soils, while others have shallow roots and can tolerate a wider range of soils. And so when we look at uh, a couple of comparisons, bur oak has a, a, has a deep tap root and it wants to grow in the soils that are deep and not hit by stone or any kind of uh, hard pan, whereas a red maple tree can it can grow pretty much anywhere and certainly grow on bedrock and in shallow permeated soils that have a, a hard pan. Uh, other species need more sunlight than others, so we know that aspen is what we would call a an intolerant to shade species. So it's intolerant; it needs full sunlight versus sugar maple. Sugar maple is a tolerant species. It can grow under its own shade. Another example is white pine. White pine needs full sunlight to regenerate and cannot reproduce under its own shade, as opposed to eastern hemlock, which certainly is the most shade tolerant of all of our species in Vermont and can regenerate underneath itself. Uh, some species can handle wet feet or saturated conditions and others can tolerate very dry conditions. You know, this is a little bit further south, bald cypress versus shortleaf pine. That would be in the south, but I got to say it's a possibility that bald cypress might be a, a species that could make it further north um, as time goes by. Another example is water tupelo uh, as being, can really handle uh, completely saturated soils where uh, bl uh, black oak or blackjack oak needs very dry conditions. So there's a lot more to talk about on different species and what they do. Um, some flower earlier than others. Uh, so red maple, when we go out in the springtime in the early part of the spring and we see that red color along the hillsides, that's all red maple flowering. And, it, and there are times when we, can, when we can see that there's a wonderful flower year going on because it's just this brilliant red across the landscape in the early spring. Um, some species have greater cold tolerance than others. So we know that balsam fir has a greater to cold tolerance than red spruce, and that has, was affected by um, acid deposition in years past. What would happen is uh, the, the acid deposition, the nitrogen would get the spruce trees to be, continue growing, and they, were, they wouldn't harden off, and they would be susceptible to frost damage or cold damage uh, in the winter because they, are, they, they did not have a great cold tolerance. Um, some species have higher nutrient demands than others. White ash really requires um, heavy nutrients, calcium, magnesium, uh, versus beech, which really can grow in some very uh, nutrient poor sites, really granitic sites. There's a uh, New Hampshire, interestingly, in Vermont. Vermont has a lot more limestone soils than both our neighbors in New York and New Hampshire. So we have an opportunity here to be um, lucky to have a lot more sugar maple than and little less of a beach problem here. All right, I just wanted to show this quick little slide. It's too, it's too busy, but and I'm not going to go over it in great detail, but just see where I've circled things in the columns. So the shade tolerance, if we look at sugar maple, it's shade tolerant. We look at paper birch, it's intolerant, intolerant to shade. Zooming over to lifespan of trees, that means a lot that a uh, red maple versus a sugar maple, these are both trees that we do manage uh, for timber, but we also manage for sugaring. And if you think about how long a tree will live, uh, the sugar maple will live twice as long as a red maple tree will because it's not as susceptible to disease. So red maple is a shorter term, has a shorter life term, and um, that's reason to be thinking about how, when and how you regenerate that species. Um, site requirements, when we're really talking about nutrients, um, white ash, as I mentioned before, really needs that high nutrient level. And uh, pin cherry, which is a early successional species that uh, doesn't need nutrients to start, but actually adds nutrients to the soil and it acts as if it's a nurse tree. So it's providing nutrients as it's growing, maintaining and holding the nutrients on the site, not allowing them to leach out. So it is a species that is important to take over a site that has been maybe burned, because it's another name for the pin cherry is fire cherry. It's really well in mineral soil, but the next species that come in might be the white ash and the sugar maple. So something, um, thing, something about ecosystem uh, an ecology is that one species can influence another. 
So looking at shade tolerance really quickly, we have extremely intolerant species like aspens and gray birch and willows, uh, and extremely tolerant species like beech and sugar maple, hardack, hemlock. I would say beech, hardack, and hemlock are probably the most sh shade tolerant of all the species in Vermont. Sugar maple is shade tolerant, but really does still need a little bit of sunlight. Um, and in between, there's, there's areas in between, intolerant species, intermediate, intolerant. Uh, but you can see that there's a variety of how uh, trees grow in the environment. And that's going to depend on, on disturbance and openings and how we manage our forests. If you want to learn more about this, um, this is a really wonderful publication. The Silvix of North America, there's a conifer volume and a hardwood volume. And it is full of fabulous information. I, I actually. I really enjoy reading about trees, so I can spend time with the silvics of North America and have over my career. Um, looking at site, site is, is the habitat for the tree, and it's the sum total of all physical factors influencing its growth. Um, soil is the base. You know, we think about soil as being the stage. If we can protect the stage, then we can protect the forest. And even though the forest may change over time because of climate, if we have the soil conditions and healthy soils, we are going to be able to have the healthy forest. Um, and climate. Climate is affected by latitude, elevation, and aspect. So in Vermont, it's really interesting because we have a re really varied topographic landscape. So we will have areas that are uh, conducive to growing the species that are here now well, well into the future, as well as maybe getting some changes. So we have good soils and a varied uh, uh, topographic environment in our geography. So we have a lot of habitat niches. So looking at uh, what I'm talking about is um, physical site factors, bedrock, the superficial deposits, soils, hydrology, and then topography, the slope aspect and elevation. And these are easily observed compared to climate and natural processes. So we know if we can look at these physical site factors, there's a lot we can determine and we can measure them and, and look at them and know what they are. Um, this is another busy slide. I'm not going to go in, take any time on this, but just to show that there is a very big distinction of species that need different levels of nutrient, different levels of moisture, and soil temperature. If we could um, take a quick look at sugar maple, I just want to point out that it needs a high moisture content, but does not cannot uh, cannot tolerate a saturated wet feet. Um, it just needs to have the right amount of moisture and a high level of nutrients and uh, important to have the soil temperature just right and the light um, can be a low level of light. So bedrock, we've got lots of different uh, types of bedrock, granite, limestone, schist, shale, slate is, are some examples. Um, we have a fair amount of limestone soils in Vermont, so in limestone soils have a high nutrient capacity, so there's lots of calcium and, and uh, magnesium in those soils. Um, the distinct characteristics of soils are um, based on each one of these soils has different different chemistry, different resistance, different texture, and so therefore they affect the community distribution. Um, if you look quickly at this bedrock map of Vermont, you can see that um, we've broken this uh, into uh, biophysical regions, and you can see that along the, the spine of the Green Mountains, uh, it's somewhat uh, Non-calcareous, there's a lot of schist and gneiss, so these are kind of low in nutrients as opposed to if you look down here in the valley, we have a lot of very rich carbonate rich sites, and so those are good for growing ash and sugar maple. We have a fair amount of that along the spine here um, with different, uh, different geology that is providing different habitat types. And if you look down at below, I'm going to just point out a couple of this, these. This is a limestone bluff cedar pine forest that is found really only along uh, Lake Champlain, along the shores, on these limestone soils on, that are on a bluff. Uh, Men from Magog may have some of this as well. But this is a rare community in Vermont because much of our shoreline has been developed. So servicial deposits are another thing. That's the, the soil. Where, where did it come from? It primarily came from the glacial till that, uh, because all of Vermont was covered by the glacier 10 to 12,000 years ago. And 
it's, it varies because in general, it's influenced by the bedrock from which it came from, but that may not be the bedrock which is over, it's overlaying. So it depends on where it came from because it got moved around by the glacier. Um, so it's very diverse, and glacial till covers most of Vermont. And this is a look at the surficial geology of Vermont. I just want to point out um, some of these are old uh, outwash sites of uh, rivers and lakes of the Lake of uh, Lake Vermont and Champlain Sea have deposited clays and sands where a river had had, had its mouth coming into the lake. Uh, and those are now places where we either mine sand or we can uh, build our houses there. And so these communities are also somewhat rare in Vermont because they have been utilized for other purposes. Um, we can tell also the type of conditions of nutrients and, and soil moisture by soil indicator plants. So one of the things that I've found throughout my career to be really just a lot of fun, uh, but also really gives me a lot of knowledge, is to know what indicator plants tell me about certain site conditions. So rich soils, we have blue cohosh, maidenhair fern, squirrel corn, hepatica, wild leeks. If you walk through a forest and you can smell onions, you're probably walking on a wild leek. And that wild leek is telling you that this is the best growing ground for sugar maple and ash that there is because it's really rich. But I also can look at acid soils and, and wet soils. And if I'm looking at a wet soil condition and I'm finding a lot of cinnamon fern, I may be in a forested wetland. If I'm looking at sensitive fern, I don't want to put my skid road there. So there's things that kind of influence what I want to do with fern as a manager, but it also tells me what kind of species are going to be there. Uh, wool grass is going to be found in a bog. Uh, when I find sensitive fern, I'm probably looking for silver maple. So there's a lot of things that are associated with others. It's fun to learn these plants and they tell you a lot. Uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures. Uh, wild leeks, this is a, it's, a, it's a plant that I try to eat every spring um, uh, just to get a little bit of that, that uh, Vermont nutrients into my system. Um, but this is the one that smells like onions because it is one and it's on rich site. Blue cohosh, another rich site indicator with a blue berry at the top um, that persists after the leaves fall off and you can sometimes see it in the winter above the snow. The most beautiful fern I think we have, just my opinion, but maidenhair fern. Beautiful plant, easily, easily identified. Nothing else looks like it, and it's an indicator of uh, rich soils. Wild ginger, often found right directly on the limestone bedrock, um, and it can, it's an edible plant. Uh, does taste like ginger, smells like ginger. It's a beautiful ant or beetle-pollinated plant. So again, looking at site, we're looking at hydrology as another component of what we're thinking about. Um, we Abundance is uh, key in determining which communities grow there. It's also going to determine what's an upland forest versus a wetland forest, and that's based on hydrology. So looking at these photographs, um, there's, it's an indicator. We have a, a, an emergent swamp on the upper left-hand corner of the property, of the, sorry, of the, of the slide, with red maple and spruce growing on the hillsides be, beside it. Here we have an alder uh, swamp with a slow-moving, meandering uh, sh uh, river system there, uh, with, and that's a, a floodplain forest that gets, that's consistently wet. And then we have a very dry upland oak forest here. So those oak forests, these trees could not grow in this frequently flooded riparian zone. Vermont climates, it's a long snowy winters typically with short summers. Um, the average January temperature is 20 degrees Fahrenheit, average July is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. We have a variable um, precipitation range anywhere from 30 to 90 inches with 90 inches happening at the top of the mountains and 30 inches probably down along the Champlain Valley. Uh, winds are from the west and the south and the weather is very, very changeable as we know in Vermont. Um, this Vermont climate, of course, is changing. Our winters are less snowy, they are, they are shorter, our summers are longer. We've got about a, probably about a month longer growing season than we did um, 50 years ago. Um, looking uh, also at climate, it affects range. So these are two, a good example of our maple species. Red, as you can see on the left that uh, red maple actually has a much larger range, and so therefore we know that it's going to be able to handle any kind of climate change um, impacts over into the future, and it also is incredibly gen variable genetically. It grows in all kinds of situations from the tops of mountains to swamps, so it can be in droughty conditions versus uh, wet conditions. It can grow everywhere, as opposed to sugar maple, which has a much smaller, more compact 
range, and that's going to be affected by by climate change. You can see how the bottom of its range is not that far south of Vermont, um, although it does still grow in the Carolinas and in Virginia, um, but it also is very picky on the landscape of where it can grow. Um, looking at this precipitation map, um, I just re reiterate what I said before, that the low rainfall is primarily in the Champlain Valley and the higher upper rainfall is up in the tops of the, the greens. Our, precip our weather patterns come from the west to the east and get basically get stopped by the uh, elevation of the Green Mountains and so the rain events happen there. Um, we break things into biophysical regions, uh, the Champlain Valley, Northern Green Mountains, Southern Green Mountains, the Taconics, Southern Piedmont, the Northern Piedmont, and the Northern Highlands. So all of these have specific climactic conditions that are, are different enough that we have sort of uh, a, a varied amount of different kinds of natural communities. So climate has a, has a major effect. Topography affects um, climate as well because of the slope, its aspect and the elevation. The higher up you go, the temperatures are going to be lower. There's going to be different rainfall events like I just described. The slope um, and aspect, uh, the north slope is going to certainly be cooler than the south slope, so we're going to get a different species composition on, on uh, east or west or south facing slopes, um, and the steepness of the slope will also have an impact. Um, uh, showing this north aspect, that's a hemlock forest growing there. West and south, we're going to find more oak um, growing, and, and then on the uh, on other other slopes, we can find pine. So we've got a, a few pine trees growing on this very exposed, steep south-facing and west-facing slope. Um, elevation makes a big difference. Height above the sea level, it's, there's varying uh, environments going upslope and downslope. And, and even in Vermont, we have remnant alpine populations at the very top of uh, Mount Mansfield, which is a refugia for, from a past time period. Um, oops. So this is just an example, again, of different kinds of conditions, where, or different kinds of uh, aspects and elevations, where the lowland on the left, um, we have a river system with a spruce fir lowland type, and then a rocky outcrop on the right. Steepness um, is uh, uh, it's different at different locations, and the incline is going to make a difference about what species can grow there. Um, it's related because it because it's related to the soil development and drainage. So if you have a very steep slope, it's going to be excessively drained, so there will not be a lot of moisture there, and the only species that can grow can, will be species that can grow in droughty conditions. And you can sort of look at this in a slope position. So you have upper slopes. It's drier on the upper slopes, the thinner soil due to past erosion. Um, mid slopes are sort of intermediate, and then the lower slopes are much more sheltered. They're, they tend to be moister and richer because of the soil movement has gone down slope over the last 12,000 years. Um, this is a great picture of the topography of varying slope aspect and elevation, and you can see some differences in, in the uh, species composition that is happening there. Now I'm going to quickly talk about disturbance. Um, we've got just a few minutes. I'd like to zoom through this so we have time for questions. Um, the stand disturbance in, in Vermont, um, there's several different types of disturbances, wind, ice, fire, flooding, pest, and then of course there's human disturbance. The, the type of disturbance that really defined our northern hardwood forest throughout the ecoregion are small minor wind events which blow down anywhere from a tenth of an acre to maybe two acres in size. This happens on a regular basis and has developed our, our northern hardwood with a diverse um, species composition and a diverse structure. Um, so we, and those happen, those wind events happen maybe once every 120, 150 years as opposed to stand replacing systems like hurricanes which actually only happen maybe once every thousand years. So in Vermont we don't really have those fast sweeping uh, changes in, our, in, a, in, a, in the forested condition like they might happen in the Mississippi Valley where massive flooding completely alters the environment or out west where fires completely change the environment where you can have 10,000 acres burned. Our forests are considered asbestos forests. There's really no asbestos there uh, in the forest but it is the, the moisture content and the humidity minimizes fire risk. So 
we do have ice storms. The 1998 was the biggest ice storm in our recorded history, but we get more and more frequent ice storms because of climate change, and they, dra they dramatically affect the forest. There are ways to manage your forest and have a stronger architecture in the, in the crown to withstand some of the ice loads, um, but that's going to be something that we have to work on over, in, over time to adapt to climate change. Um, flooding as a stand disturbance that I described would be happening in the Mississippi Valley, but it also happens here along our riparian areas, and that causes things like silver maple and willow to be the dominant species. Uh, silver maple can handle wet feet for weeks on end, where sugar maple would die if it had, was flooded for over a week or two. Um, pests certainly um, make a difference in our forest, and of course, humans have disturbed the landscape more than any of these combined. Most, um, you know, in, by the middle of the 1800s, we had pretty much clear-cut um, most of the forest in Vermont. The only things left were the lowland wetlands, the upland um, mountaintops, and uh, farm sugar bushes primarily. So there was very 80% of the forest had been clear-cut. So succession is what happens after you've made those disturbances, either natural or man-made. Um, and it's, it's what changes over time. Species come in, early successional species like gray birch and paper birch and aspen. Uh, those are species that come in first in, into a stand pin cherry, and then they act as nurse trees and provide shade and provide nutrients, and so another species will come in underneath them. So it, it goes through a, a process, um, and it, we often look at this as a very exacting process, but in reality in our forest it's constantly being changed and constantly being mixed, and it relies on the tolerance of shade of different species. Um, I'm just going to quickly see what we, if we do that typical, we've got a field, turns it into a shrubland, then a few trees come in like gray birch, and now we're starting to get a mix of hardwoods, and, now, and then eventually those hardwoods are, compete with each other, so we end up with large diameter, older trees, and then a, a finally an older forest that will regenerate itself. Another quick picture of that very thing that I just talked about as we succeed through a shrubland forest to a fully mature forest. Um, it informs management. Uh, we can integrate the knowledge of, of ecology. We know the silvics, we know the site conditions, and we know the natural processes. And so when we know all of those things together, we can work to, to manage our forest. Because what we want to do as good managers is to mimic uh, the natural system, to mim mimic the ecosystem that would exist without our influence. We, forestry really is the art and science of uh, growing trees, which is either to speed up or slow down what nature would, would do on its own. But the only way we can do this is if we really understand ecology. So ecology is the basis for all of our silvics, all of our silviculture, and all of our management. So here's the, my last slide of the day, and I think I came out exactly on time that I wanted to, which is probably the first, but forestry itself is the art of handling the forest so that it will render whatever service is required of it without being impoverished or destroyed. Now this quote came from Gifford Pinchot, who was our first uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, pres um, leader, and he was uh, appointed by Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, he, so he was the first U.S. forester, and he was a utilization forester, but he understood that the forest had many functions and that we needed to protect it because we had not been protecting it up until that time. And our current, uh, bi most, one of the most famous biologists on the planet today, still alive in his 80s, is uh, E.O. Wilson, uh, and the crucial factor in the life and death of a species is the amount of suitable habitat left to them. So one of the things that E.O. Wilson, his most lit recent book, is Half Earth, and I highly recommend it, and it talks about how the way that we can protect the planet and end the biodiversity on it as much as we can, because we are losing species at a faster rate than ever before uh, since the last extinction, which was the, ex uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs. Our, the rate of extinction is, uh, is rapid, and the, the way to protect our planet is to perhaps think about um, setting aside half of the planet, 50% of the planet, for natural systems, and then 50% for human systems. Um, and we can work between those, but 50-50 is where we're, we would like to, to take a look at protecting our, our, our planet. So I highly recommend reading that book if you get an opportunity, and I will be happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Nancy, so much for that, uh, for sharing your incredible expertise and knowledge in that fantastic whirlwind tour of, of forest ecology. Um, so if anyone has some questions, you could type them into the questions or chat box below. Uh, while you were speaking, we have a question from David. Um, oh boy, just got really small. There it is. Okay. Um, so, oh boy, my apologies. Um, I like to hide. Uh, Nancy, can you speak a little bit more to vernal pools? You had mentioned that they were disappearing. Uh, can you speak to why that is and what we could do, if anything, to maintain them? Yeah, sure. Um, so vernal pools are small, tiny little um, wetland water bodies on our landscape that actually are hard to see, except for when they are filled with water, which will be in the spring. Uh, so sometimes they get uh, destroyed not on purpose, but by mistake, when harvesting takes place. So if you put a skitter next to a vernal pool and create ruts next to that vernal pool, you can create, a, you could fool the, 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 the salamanders that are coming back to the pool for breeding and the, and the uh, frogs that are coming back to the pool for breeding, because water will pool up in that skitter tire uh, rut and they may breed there. And of course, that's going to dry up before uh, the their eggs can turn into um, adults and, and, re and leave the pool. So being careful about where you put uh, machinery is really important. We think of vernal pools as having at least 100 feet of no impact around them. That's a protection zone. And then there's a life zone that goes out another 500 feet. So you have a 600 foot width around the pool that should have minimal disturbance. Uh, the more down woody material in that life zone, the better, because that's where the mole salamanders spend their entire life cycle, except for when they come out and breed one crazy night uh, in the springtime. So making sure that we know where they are is the first step, to identify them on your property, know where they are, and make sure that we can protect them when something's taking place. They're under pressure due to climate change because we have less snow in the winter. Rain seeps away and, and rushes away as opposed to slowly melting and, and pooling up. So with a lower snowpack, we're going, to have few, we're going to have fewer of these vernal pools and if drier conditions. Uh, the pools will dry up too soon for some of the salamanders to make it full to maturity. So that's one of, those are some of the pressures that we have. And because of the pressures, it means there's a greater responsibility for us to identify them across the landscape. Because there, there are pools that are going to be are more highly functional, but there's a lot that are, are shallow and can produce animals, but they may not be great pools for the spotted salamanders or for the Jefferson salamanders. They may be perfectly good for wood frogs, which um, mature quite quickly. But um, sal salamanders need to go through July, middle of July, before they actually reach maturity and can can crawl out of that pool. So I, I hopefully I, I answered your question. There are several obligate species. Most of the mole salamanders, which include spotted Jefferson, uh, dusky, not dusky, sorry. Um, uh, I'm forgetting right now, sorry, and and uh, blue spotted salamander, and then we have wood frogs and uh, fingernail clams and um, fairy shrimp. Those are all species that are obligate species to uh, vernal pools. Great, thank you. Our next question is um, Irene wrecked havoc along our small stream, da downing trees along the banks. Now the knotweed is taking over. Is there any hope trees can outcompete and return to stabilize the banks. And this comes from Joanne. Okay, so uh, one of the things that happened in Irene was the scouring of the, of the river banks, which uh, when soil is disturbed, invasive species have an edge. And uh, that the establishment of knotweed, knotweed is an invasive species, and invasive species succeed because they have incredible reproduction uh, capabilities and just about any piece of the plant of a knotweed can turn into a fully grown knotweed of the leaf, the stem, the root. Um, so it is a very difficult species to control. Um, so controlling them, it's uh, there are ways to do it. Um, I think some of the uh, there are some companies that are able to manage this through herbicide control. There's also if you have small patches of it, you can 
the, the thinking is if you mow it five times for five years in a row, you can, you can get rid of it. Uh, I'm not sure that happens, but I've been able to kind of contain knotweed and not let it spread by, do, by using that technique. Uh, the other thing to do is to plant trees within the knotweed. You, I'm not sure it can become established. The knotweed is very dense, and the species that, re, that occur in floodplain forest are shade intolerant species, so they won't do well underneath the knotweed. We may have to actually take drastic measures and do some planting and, and keep those trees free from competition. So there's herbicide control, small patches, you can put an old rug on it or just keep mowing, 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 mowing. Uh, it's a tough one, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, there, we've got several issues uh, in the state regarding invasive species and that's a, that's a, it's a difficult one because it does not hold the soil. Um, Hopefully, I gave you some ideas. And if I could add to that, too, one resource that you might be able to look up some more information on knotweed and management is vtinvasives.org. Uh, this is a website that we manage and just recently updated with a lot more information um, regarding management of invasive species. So that might be a good place to, to learn a little bit more. Uh, and, and the last question that we have comes from Rob and Linda. Do you have a slide show, uh, showing the relative species distribution of trees for Windsor County? If not, can you comment on the distribution? I don't have that. Um, so I guess what I would suggest is that you might want to contact the county forester in Windsor County um, to look at the species because there is a variety of uh, natural communities throughout the state. Um, and I'm not as familiar with Windsor County, so I, I Northern Hardwood would be there. There's, uh, I think, uh, some of the, even the Black Gum Swamp is nearby, although that might be Wyndham. Um, I, I'm sorry, I really can't answer that. There's not really a species distribution map for any of Vermont in, a, in that fine quality. Uh, you can look at things uh, individually or on an ortho photo and get a good kind of a good idea of what softwood is there and what hardwood is there and, and along the riparian areas you can make some um, educated uh, assessments of, of what might be growing there. So I'm not sure we actually have distribution maps um, available anywhere. Um, maybe Gwen you might know more about that. I don't know. Um, and, and any other questions? We have got a few minutes left, but if there's no other questions, I just want to thank Nancy for her time and thank the participants for taking the time to be engaged with us and ask really great questions. Um, this will be recorded and posted on the website tomorrow. So thank you all, and have a good evening. Yes, and thank you.